Being in the World, Part 1 The Story of Everybody's Life Ontology, the science of beingness, reveals deep insights about the nature of human life and experience. An ontological analysis of the human condition, our way of being, shows that our everyday social relations give us a particular kind of preoccupation with the world. This care about the world involves us in a network of conditions and actions we do not choose, leading us away from our authentic self. But this situation, if taken in a specific way, also permits us to investigate our human condition firsthand. Wise men down through the ages have taught that a properly performed phenomenological inquiry into human beingness can bring us to a unified ontological model of human existence, in which we at last find ourselves at home with ourselves. This realization of authentic beingness is the actual goal of human life, toward which we are relentlessly driven by the anxiety arising from falling from our real self into the world. Falling into the world. We are not alone. To exist means to be in relationship. Even to be alone implies the possibility of being in relation with others. In being with others, we typically maintain ourselves in the being of the other. That is, we see ourselves in the mirror of our actions and relations with others in the world. We lose our real self in this fundamentally inauthentic mode of being, because none of these mirrors are true. They all reflect a distorted and incomplete image of our real self. So our everyday mode of being, as we actually experience ourselves, is being in the world. We are not spectators of life from some transcendental perspective, but deeply involved in it. We cannot meaningfully conceive of our being apart from the world in which we exist. Indeed, the world is the context that gives our being its meaning and value. Yet we become overwhelmed and lose ourselves in the complex relations and reactions of living in the world. In this condition, how can we recover our authentic being? The answer to this question begins from asking how relating to ourselves and others inauthentically, in which we fail to find ourselves and so fail to achieve genuine individuality, shows up in our clearing, the space of consciousness that we are. Our ontological analysis of worldly inauthenticity focuses on three phenomena of being in the world, idle talk, curiosity, and ambiguity. Idle talk. Idle talk includes any communication outside of the ontic conversation, the inquiry into the authentic nature of our being as a discourse of phenomenological self-reflection. We examine our life not according to some superimposed external system of values, but how we actually experience it. This essay is an example of a disciplined ontic conversation. Idle talk is typical average everyday linguistic communication. All communication displays a triple ontological structure. A subject, the topic or speaker. An object, what the conversation is about. And a relation, the speaker's claim about the object. The unit of ontological structure is the triple, a triune entity usually consisting of subject, object, and relation. The figure at right represents an ontological triple with the vectors of subject, object, and relation. The triple mirrors the structure of perception and is the basic unit of ontological scientific notation, OWL, RDF, and similar formal ontological languages. In idle talk, our concern for the claim eclipses our concern for its object. In inauthentic communication, rather than trying to achieve genuine access to the object as it is, we focus on what is claimed about it. 
we take it for granted that what is said is true, without taking a good look at the object, simply because it was said. Worse, we pass it on, disseminate the claim, allow it to influence other conversations about the object, and so on. We thereby lose touch with the original object of the conversation. Our talk becomes ungrounded, empty of the authentic being of the object. We are no longer talking about the object, but about a linguistic abstraction of it. Because we seem to ourselves to understand the object, the convenience of talking about an abstraction seduces us into thinking we understand the object when we actually don't. By conveniently providing the illusion of complete understanding, idle talk closes off its objects rather than revealing them. It also discourages the possibility of future investigation of the object, because, after all, we already know all about it. This impersonal, uprooted misunderstanding, often characterized by frequent misuse of the word they, dominates our everyday relations with ourselves, the world, and others, guaranteeing that we will remain inauthentic and far from actual individuality. Curiouser and Curiouser Such an uprooted understanding of the world is detached from any particular task that might focus us upon objects as they are in themselves. Thus the term idle talk. This type of conversation tends to float away from our immediate environment towards the distant, the alien, and the exotic. And if the focus of idle talk is the novel, its primary concern tends to be with its novelty. Thus, we continually seek new objects of conversation, not in order to grasp them in their reality, but merely to stimulate ourselves with their newness, so we seek novelty with increasing force and velocity. We become compulsively curious, constantly distracted by new possibilities, and lingering on each topic for shorter and shorter periods. Our attention span atrophies as we constantly seek new stimulation. Floating everywhere, we dwell nowhere. Being systematically detached from our environment by a swelling tide of abstractions, we cannot distinguish genuine comprehension from counterfeit. The convenience of idle talk means that vapid slogans, pithy quotes, and ten-second sound bites replace reasoned analysis and discussion of every subject. Thus, in the world, superficial understanding is universally acclaimed as deep and real understanding looks eccentric and marginalized. This superficiality is not deliberate. What intelligent individual would plan such a monstrous misunderstanding? But in a social world dominated by idle talk and curiosity, it permeates the environment. It creates a general mood of groupthink, our inheritance from our fellows and culture, into which we always find ourselves thrown. The feeling of falling. These three interconnected existential characteristics, idle talk, curiosity, and the ambiguity of superficiality, reveal a basic kind of everyday being common to all of us, falling into the world. We become lost in the public world of the others. We fall away from our authentic selves and lose the potential for being with integrity, wholeness. In short, our average everyday being shows up as inauthentic. We are uprooted from any genuine concern for the world and fellow human beings by our absorption in idle talk. We waste our precious time indulging in meaningless entertainment instead of taking action to change ourselves and improve the world. In the process, we are also uprooted from any genuine self-understanding. Thus, we cannot grasp which possibilities are genuinely our own, as distinct from possibilities that anybody can have. Falling into detachment from genuine self-understanding permeates our philosophies as well as our everyday life. Indeed, human beings, for whom an understanding of their own being is natural, often accept philosophical traditions that systematically repress any real understanding of authentic being. 
Thus, instead of relentlessly pursuing the phenomenological methodology of ontic self-reflection that leads to authentic being, we content ourselves with convenient, prepackaged designations and rules for being and action made by others that have nothing to do with who we are for ourselves. Various philosophies tend to interpret human beingness as if people were non-living objects. Such ontological errors naturally emerge both from absorption in practical tasks and from the peculiar necessities of philosophical speculation. In our everyday work, inanimate objects lie temptingly available as paradigms of existence. When things need to be done, it is overwhelmingly convenient to treat human beings in the same way. Similarly, in theoretical contemplation, both objects and human beings appear as abstract models, completely detached from their contexts. Such objectification and elementalism are simply convenient shortcuts to ostensibly practical but erroneous conclusions about our beingness. Because of our inherent relatedness and our tendency to lose ourselves in the other, once such misinterpretations become established in philosophical discourse, succeeding generations tend to accept them unquestioningly as self-evident truths, as tradition, what everybody knows, or common sense. Another type of philosopher rejects common sense in favor of ever more novel, even bizarre hypothetical constructions. Perhaps their theoretical convolutions confer upon their adherents a thrill of astonishment at the exotic products of their intellectual advancement. But despite their revolt against common sense, they are no less slaves to the consensual hallucination of the world. Real philosophy must be grounded in phenomenological, ontological inquiry into human beingness in the first person, as lived or on the field, rather than in the third person, as a spectator in the stands, or as theory and speculation. <laughs>